right, we're gonna get started here in just another moment. We've got our 40 plus attendees already. Since we've already got a bunch of folks on the line here, we'll start with some introductions of regional center staff. So good morning. My name is John Decker, the director of community services at Alta California Regional Center. And I am going to just call off the names and I'll have some folks wave to you that work at our regional center. So I'm going to start right next to I've got Marty there. Marty, good morning. And I've got Dee Dee. And we've got Michelle Johnson, our director of client services. Good morning, Michelle. And Gina Nessie, our community services manager. And another one of our community services specialists. We've got Denise and Shirley, who is responsible for so many of your vendorizations. And Christina Suji. Good morning, Christina. And we've got Hewitt, our emergency coordinator. Good morning, Hewitt. Back with us again. We realized yesterday that we did not have you at our provider advisory committee meeting. So I think you are now uh, cordially invited to our provider advisory committee meeting next month so that you can meet everyone um, that's part of our provider advisory committee. And we have Natalie Perone as well. Good morning, Natalie, one of our specialists. And we have Olivia back with us again, our community services manager, again, who is so responsible for so many of your vendorizations and Jean's teammate, Jean and I are immensely pleased to have uh, Olivia back with us again here. And then we have Tracy Brown, one of our associate client services directors. And we've got Zach, the executive assistant that works with me. And that's about our group, at least so far of regional center staff that I see. Um, but you guys are always welcome uh, to put your name in the chat if you guys are joining us and I haven't seen you on camera yet. Catherine just joined so, on. Oh, and Catherine Weston, client services manager. Catherine Weston, uh, <laughs> that's how I'm introducing her now um, at this on point. November 1st, that's right. That's right, November 1st. Uh, Catherine, uh, it has been announced in this meeting last week, we'll be joining our Woodland office and uh, certainly proud of Catherine on her promotion and um, I'm so happy that Kanisha is going to have you as a partner in that Woodland office. Um, I, you know, the staff are lucky and our management are lucky. So um, we'll look forward to that. We will uh, be looking at posting the position for the um, HCBS specialist um, for our regional center. So Olivia's back. She'll start doing that. Um, just talking about new positions as well. Um, we are going to begin interviews for the deaf specialist position that is going to be within our community services department. So again, that's going to be an individual that's going to be responsible for making sure that we meet our requirements to provide services to our entire community, including those deaf individuals, um, hard of hearing individuals um, that require services. And so not only resource development, but again, also serving as a resource, we hope to our um, service coordinators as well and making sure that they've got all the services that are necessary. Um, <clears throat> so, talking about the discussions that we're going to be going over here, um, uh, Jean's going to briefly be discussing about the uh, participant directed services and the uh, there's some proposed language for uh, codification um, that she's going to be going over. We're going to be spending some time talking about discussing the public health order um, impacts within agencies. There was uh, a, a discussion that we started yesterday, I think, in the uh, provider advisory committee. By the way, it's such a big packed agenda. We still ended up going over time, but um, I think there's a lot of providers that um, are going to have questions and I think we'll all do our very best to discuss them. The extent to which we're able to give, you know, definable answers is kind of another part of it, but um, we also, you know, we, we continue to receive some feedback from you guys as well. We received some feedback from one of um, our larger service providers just this morning regarding some of the challenges that they're facing. And so, again, I think this is just a great opportunity for you guys to kind of discuss with each other a little bit about what you're facing. If at anything, you know, you guys need to know that everyone is in this together. And um, as I mentioned yesterday during our provider advisory committee, not since, you know, the 4.25% payment reduction went into place, you know, at 12, 13 years ago, have we dealt with something so, um, uh, equally challenging to face across all of our different types of service providers. Um, 
I will also say we have uh, Ms. Cindy Lay, who has also joined us this morning. Good morning, Cindy, one of our community services specialists who does uh, primarily her employment, employment work. And she's actually going to be uh, taking on a little bit of a different role because uh, we're going to be bringing on another position um, to support our employment and day programming. And so we're going to free up Cindy to do a little bit more of those outreach activities that we appreciate from her. Um, we really need to get out there amongst the employment community. And uh, we think Cindy's going to be able to do that a little bit more with uh, freeing her up some of her time. Uh, so welcome, and then um, we're going to discuss briefly the survey that we're planning on putting out um, and to help us in our response to the challenges facing the vaccine mandate with all of our um, in all of our, excuse me, um, service providers and their employees and, and our regional center as well. Uh, we're going to give you an update on the housing access services and where we're at with that. We're going to give an update on the COVID boosters and um, then we're going to just kind of open up for some a little bit further discussion. So uh, before I get rolling too deep into it, Gene, I'm going to throw it over to you related to the uh, participant directed services and the, the mesh message that you would like to share to this group. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, pretty much just want to bring your attention to the um, proposed, the, the proposed uh, regulations for participated directed services and the the um, proposal being that the department is <clears throat> they waive some of the regulations around for ILS PA and employment during COVID and like John had said they are now proposing to codify those and put them in title 17. So there the proposal is to add those um, three services to the participated directive services in Title 17. And um, wanted to just draw your attention to them, go ahead and ask you to review them um, for the review them and then send any um, feedback that you would have would be greatly appreciated. And if you wanted to send it to Nicole Smith, who is our special community service specialist that oversees the FMS agencies, this is different than FMS for SDP. These are our regular FMS agencies um, that we're looking at. So wanted to um, share that information with you and let me see, where's the best place, John, do you think for them to, to get the information? On the web, I didn't look on DDS's website to be sure it was there. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, regarding the participant directed services, if there's folks that have already seen what the proposed language looks like, we would certainly be willing to have a discussion here specifically related to it, but, um, Again, you know, the proposal, as Jean mentioned, is, you know, the codification, uh, which we knew because we know that there was specific budget line items this year for turning the directives that have been issued into law, meaning that they are no longer just a directive from the department, but that they turn into something that, you know, becomes uh, codified, as Jean mentioned, and then becomes more long term. So. Again, um, Nicole is going to be kind of responsible for giving um, some feedback to. Uh, Jean and I, and then we will look at the, uh, forwarding that feedback on to the um, uh, Association of Regional Center Agencies so that it can go to the, um, uh, excuse me, so that it can go to the Department of Developmental Services. So that's kind of, you know, it as it relates to that stuff. Just again, Nicole is kind of our point person on it. Um, so, you know, questions, concerns, you know, certainly Nicole would be the person, and her email is just nsmith at altaregional.org. I'm sure one of my many staff can drop that into our, have already dropped it into the box. Very good. Um, faster than I had a chance to even say it. I also want to welcome, I introduced some folks. Johnny Zhang has also joined us. Johnny is one of another one of our associate client services directors and um, is responsible. She, he oversees uh, the residential, a lot of our adult services as well. Um, so welcome Johnny too. So I want to get into a discussion about the public health order. Um, I think uh, things are 
coming together for service providers. Um, we have begun receiving um, letters. We've begun receiving correspondence from providers related to their concerns about their capacity to be able to continue to operate in December. Um, and so uh, we're certainly very concerned about that. Um, and I wanna repeat what our plan is, at least as it relates to a survey, and then we're gonna kind of just dive into this a little bit more. I know there was some questions that came from CBIM yesterday um, about, you know, the applicability of it. Um, I think yeah, I saw Nikki on here too from Enriching Lives. So I know that there's certainly some, I think, pending FHA questions that are out there. And so maybe Nikki, if you want to, we can have you chime in a little bit about where you guys are at right now and your thoughts. And so we'll get to that um, as well for you guys. But Again, just want to create a place where we can discuss this. Um, we are recording this. You know, we recorded last week as well. Uh, we know that not everyone's able to participate in in these types of meetings. Um, and you know, if Yvonne asked me to do something, I feel like I have to do it. And so, um, so we have uh, done a recording of the uh, last one. I made poor Gino Nessie listen to herself talking last week um, in the meeting. We we listened to the re recording a little bit. So. Um, we need to figure out how we're going to look at posting some of these things, but I understand that there's valuable discussions that are going on in these meetings. It sounds like, you know, we certainly are committed as a regional center to continuing to offer this forum for us to connect um, as we're dealing with truly unprecedented things. Um, I don't want to say like weekly, but we're at a point now where this is, is this as unprecedented as it gets? We, we've certainly not had to face kind of what we're facing right now and the um, lack of, you know, foreknowledge of where we're going to land with this in December, I know is extremely concerning to all of you that run these businesses. So we'll get an opportunity to talk about that. But I want to reiterate the survey idea, which is, um, you know, we are looking at sending out a survey to providers and the providers that would need to respond to the survey are only those individuals that are in essence responding positively about it. We're not looking to try to get, um, an answer from every single provider on um, what their availability is going to be on December 1st. There's 1200 vendorizations that are regularly um, uh, billing the regional center. And so it would be unrealistic for us to gather that type of information as well as be able to disseminate it. However, what we have realized is that by about next week and the week after that, you're gonna start having a pretty firm picture of what your agency is gonna look like effective December 1st. For those uh, service providers, what we're gonna be asking in the survey is to identify the name of your company, your vendor number, the service code. We're gonna want you to affirm that you will be able to accept new referrals that could be effective December 1st. And obviously we want other counties that you can serve as well. What we intend to do is take this, um, we know that you guys respond to our surveys because we get so many survey responses. In this particular case, we're looking at, we want responses from those people that we are gonna have the availability because we need to provide resources to our service coordinators. We had, um, and I don't know if he's on this week, but we had Phil Perez from Merikey on either last week or the week before that. And um, Merikey provides our enhanced behavioral support homes, some of them from our regional center. One of the questions was, Where's the safety net here? Where is the safety net? It came up during our provider advisory committee meeting yesterday. What's the regional center doing um, to deal with the impending crisis that's going to exist primarily, possibly, in the residential world, in the world of supported living, in the world of residential care facilities and things like that? The best thing that we can do is try to determine what other resources we could possibly use when we find out, and uh, that is the expectation, that you will be reaching out to service coordinators, letting them know preferably as much in advance of December 1st as possible about your capacity to be able to serve folks. There's one other piece of information that we wanted to discuss, and this is in light of the discussion yesterday at the provider advisory committee related to um, in-person versus remote services. There is also, I foresee a likelihood that there's gonna be some providers that are gonna say, we're gonna be so short on staff that we may be able to serve folks on December 1st, but we're only gonna be able to do that remotely. We are not going to be able to do that in person. Now, certainly SLS, you know, FHAs, uh, you guys don't have these options. Uh, residential care providers don't have the option of providing these, but I think it is still important for us to gather that data point because there might be some um, 
there might be some providers that just say that December 1st are no longer going to be in operation. And so with that being said, we will choose alternative remote services from someone over nothing for our clients every day of the week. And so um, we are also going to uh, include, include that little data um, piece as well in the survey that we're putting out. So with that being said, um, we know that there was some feedback that was starting to be received kind of yesterday during our provider advisory committee. And what I would like to do is open up for discussion amongst the group here um, related to your concerns, what you're finding out right now. Um, and I'm hoping that we can all serve as a resource to each other as we kind of talk about this, because obviously Alta has had to analyze this for our own regional center as well and for all of our employees. So um, I'm wondering if folks are interested in discussing this. I know I called on Nikki. I don't know if we'll have to make her first, but if she wants to be, she certainly can be. Um, and then from there, maybe we can roll into some other folks. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk. Um, so right now we're, we, we're sending out information to our family home providers, um, updating them about the public health order. We have had a number of providers who have chosen to get vaccinated um, prior to this public health order, and we have a handful who um, we are working on right now to get vaccinated. Um, as we are reading the public health order and our attorneys are, um, we're finding that we're falling under the family, the family aspect. And so some of the family home providers who are family units who um, won't be doing respite might not need to be vaccinated under this order. Um, so that is something that we're looking at. Um, we're looking at some different ways that we can um, expand our services so that um, more people might be able to be served in the family home model. Um, you know, possibly doing a third bedroom, like doing a health and safety waiver for a third bedroom within family homes. We have some homes who do have the capability of that. Uh, looking at the relative model, we have uh, people who've reached out who want to open their or keep their children or family member in their home, but do need more supports to make that successful. Um, so looking at that and then, you know, so pause, pause real yeah. quick, Nikki, let's, yeah. let's clarify exactly what you mean. Cause we got all kinds of different people that do different types of services. Right. So for those, um, individuals, let's say they are receiving support living services and they are going to be without a support system. Mm -hmm. Um, and the family members have indicated that they would be willing to possibly become a family home agency provider. And I know, uh, uh, Denise, we had an email back and forth with uh, Michelle Kirsten specifically about this a little bit earlier in the week as well. Uh, first off, I just want to say providers that reach out to us with creative ideas on how we can address this possible impending crisis of uh, residential supports are greatly appreciated. Please, um, any ideas that folks have, um, reach out to your community services specialist. Um, send an email. Everything will get filtered through. Olivia will review everything. Gina will look at everything. I'll look at everything that comes in. Um, we're going to rely on you guys a lot as it relates to this. And so what you're indicating then, Nikki, is that, you know, you could reach out to that family home agency for the possibility of becoming uh, certified. Am I saying that right? Right. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and and as Denise had mentioned, you know that is something that has always been available. However, mm -hmm. the utilization of it has been very minimal, and right. everything needs to be on the table, folks. Um, we're going to be looking at health and safety, health and safety, health and safety. And so, um, Nikki, uh, I appreciate. Uh, I would like to share some of the challenges that the FHAs are facing um, yeah. when it comes to. Uh, guidance and things like that. So, 1 of the things I know I'm aware of, and this crosses over with California mentor as well, and some mm -hmm. of their discussions that they've been having is. You know, you might have 1 regional center, like Alta that says, hey, if you're willing to uh, not do any respites, if you're willing to only have them in that own in you know, services within that own home, then the exception that you're looking at providing seems like it may be founded. Right? Um, right. And again. Uh, Gina Onesi, I forgot to make my original disclaimer upon hitting the record button that I am not an employee of the California <laughs> Department of Public Health. 
Um, I forgot about that. And so uh, anything that we say, again, as we relate to all of this stuff is our best way to figure this out with you, but it's not figuring it out for you. Um, the, at the end of the day, you guys all hold your own personal responsibilities to your companies as to the liability that you're going to take on how you um, implement the public health order. And um, to talk more about the challenges facing FHAs, you then also have some regional centers that have made it clear, like, well, no, that only really applies to people's own homes and they're receiving right. services in like an adult foster home. And that's really not their own home per se. Um, but then Los Angeles County came out with guidance saying, oh, no, we think that does apply um, for FHAs. Um, so yeah. a little confusion, right? So um, I, again, uh, as it relates to it, that's... <laughs> That's just one example from FHAs about the challenges that they're looking at facing um, in implementing this. Other thing, sorry, other things, Nikki, that you guys are seeing or, or looking at implementing within um, your company. You know, one of the other thoughts we had that we haven't talked much about yet, but if there are care homes that are choosing not to move forward with the vaccination, if there are made matches there, that might be a possibility for them to become family home providers and uh, work with an individual that they're serving in a care home um, because again it would be just that family unit that they would be working with um, so that that's an option that people might have that we haven't really explored that much and again everything is on the table it's so funny though you think about it how many years have we tried to resist having you guys lose your family homes because people apply to become um, residential care providers, yeah. right? Like usually, we, over the years, that's always what we've looked at, and I know that that yeah. you know many of your you know the FHAs will talk about that. Like, hey, that's not why you're getting all this training is so that you can turn around and open up your own care home. But again, everything has to be on the table, right? We all have to be right. discussing about ways to do this. Um, yeah. Any so I would just say as you hear Nikki talk about these things and what they're looking at within their agency. Um, you know, does anyone else want to share questions that have come up amongst their staff, questions that have come up amongst their leadership? I think our biggest question is like the liability risk that we're taking on and what we're willing to take on for the liability of moving forward with people who are not vaccinated. I mean, that's a big risk, um, but being homeless is also a huge risk. And, you know, what which one? Which, which is a harder thing to swallow, you know, a harder pill to swallow is I'd rather somebody have a home than look at the risk of the the liability there. Yeah, and, and again, everyone is going to have to look at making those determinations, you know, for their companies. And I understand, you know, people are reaching out to employment attorneys and employment attorneys mm -hmm. are wondering what regional centers are saying about this. I would share because, again, we don't always have the same people at every meeting. One of the uh, things that has been brought up is you know, is there going to be some specific guidance for respite providers? Is there going to be specific FHA guidance that comes out like from the Department of Developmental Services in the form of a directive? My understanding is that that will not occur. That between now and when the directive comes, or excuse me, when the um, public health order, you know, is in full effect at the end of next month, that, you know, there, that we should not be having an expectation that uh, describing different types of services. The only thing I will say is, when we look at it again for our regional center, um, we really don't draw a distinction there. We do not draw any distinction between remote and in person services. So that's 1 aspect of this as well. Like, if you've got a bunch of staff and your staff are only remote. Um, that, as far as our concerns would be, you would be still be under the same requirements, um, whether you are um, providing those services or not. And the, part of the reason being, and you can certainly understand that is that. Um, uh, excuse me. I was just reminded that I need to make sure that I uh, go over the specifics of the public health order um, with you. And uh, one of the things I would like to do, as always, with our regional center is to share with you where you can find all this information on our website. So let me just share that real quickly with folks so that you know where it's at. So if you go to the front page of our website, usually we put the new information in our what's happening section. And so if you go to the what's happening section, vaccine mandates for all HSS, this has the vaccine ma uh, mandates. It has the directive right here from the Department of Developmental Services. And within this directive is the California Department of Public Health. Um, so there has not been addition. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say this. 
My understanding is that if an individual that is a regional center client is employed by you, then you are required to have them be vaccinated as well. That is that is my understanding of uh, all the discussions. I have not heard anyone say um, anything different than that. Um, and John, so I actually got an email from DDS saying the opposite. Really? I had reached out regarding participants uh, and they said if they're not providing support, then no, and I can't discriminate against uh, vaccinated or non-vaccinated folks employed by us that are participants. And that was, was it from like the, just like the, did they say the name yeah. of the person that gave you the they, response? They did. Uh, it was just like yesterday, day before. Um, Rapone Anderson. So it's a office of community operations. Okay. I, I actually asked back to the definition of worker because that's what's in question, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. They quoted me the, um, I'll put it in the chat, I guess. Because we know that we've been talking with you guys before about the frequently asked questions that they put out, right? We've discussed that and, and that you can't make that requirement. Um, but as it relates specifically to whether or not these individuals are considered workers or employees, there is the definition of a worker in here as well. A vendor cannot deny services to a consumer. Whoops. Sorry, got to find the chat again. It went away. There it is. All right. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Service provider workers who provide services to a consumer through the network of regional center services. Okay, we know that. What else we got over here? Um, the order defines people in section 1A through E. Service provider workers who provide services to a consumer through the network of regional centers serving individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities. So the argument is a vendor cannot deny services to a consumer based on the consumer's vaccination status. If the consumer is not providing services, either paid or unpaid, then the definition may not apply. Um, well, I don't know. That would be one of those ones I feel like I'm going to close my screen so I can see folks. Um, typically, the the definitiveness that I would look for, like, would be like it does not apply, not that it may not apply, because also remember, employees of DDS are not employees of California Department of Public Health either. Um, I would certainly keep any documentation that you receive from the Department of Developmental Services in relation to this. Um, I will not disseminate any information related to this unless I see DDS like write something down and they want to address it to the regional centers about it because in that case, that's something I think a little bit stronger for you guys to stand on, honestly. Um, other thoughts or comments about this? So, sorry, Andrew again. Um, yeah. I guess because I, my my question yeah was it 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 still seems like it, it might be because you're going to be in contact with folks that are providing service so it goes back to the worker but if somebody chooses not to be vaccinated and you're in one of our work programs that is purely a work group then we're going to deny you services because you're not vaccinated or have that so you're kind of in a, a pickle as far as that goes as well because there is no other like you're in a person work group we I guess you can go to alternative services at this point but yeah you know, well just like I, I mean think of those yeah um it's a tough one I I will say that is a very tough one I think um we will again we will not put out anything in writing to our service providers about it unless we have something specific from DDS that I think is really concrete, um, but I will just tell folks that I will follow up directly with Rapone related to this. Uh, I'll send an email out to him and CC Michelle Johnson so that we're all on the same page about what is allowable and not allowable. Um, I will ask for something for them to put in writing. Um, and so, sorry, one moment. Yeah, because all of the participants that we have that are employed will then be in contact with other potentially with other participants that are getting provided care. So that's the whole worker piece, right? When you're coming back. Yeah, around. yeah. no, I, yeah, I, I think that 
that would be the concern, right? And then what does that, what liability does that bring in for your company? And I don't know that DDS has the ability to release you of liability like that, honestly. Like, no, but then you can't require it either. So then we're in, <laughs> then what happens to the participants that we have to then would you give notice to, or you go, then you're like removing choice. Sorry, I'm back and forth on that. I have the whole SLS issue as well, but this is another random one. Yeah, and I and I know certainly for some providers that do both the, the I think the SLS is, issue is the one that is looming and big, but this is also one that definitive uh, information. So now that I know that they've already reached out, um, and I do certainly love it when they reach out and discuss things with our service providers without letting us know about it. But um, I, know, yeah, I had posed the question regarding that. I guess. Yeah, no, it's 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 all good. Um, I, I want to make sure that we can get something that we feel comfortable enough as a regional center standing behind and giving his guidance to you guys. And I have a really high standard for that type of stuff because I just don't want to give out uh, too much false information other than uh, apparently that DDS has weighed in on this. Um, they just haven't done it any more widely than maybe responding to particular emails. Um, so I will, um, I will certainly um, follow up with them about that. And other feedback questions concerns um related to this oh sorry not a concern but i know that um california disability services association so cdsa the uh, provider network uh, advocacy group is also looking into this as well as far as trying to get a meeting with dds to get some clarification yeah, and again, you know, we, we, we meet weekly here. So if folks do get an update from DDS, and especially if they're willing to respond to the advocacy groups or the trade groups, you know, to, to give you guys clarification, sharing with me would be great um, so that we can, you know, get that clarification shared out with everyone, you know, during this type of session. Um, you know, if, if there's something in writing that we get, that would certainly go out in writing to everyone as well. We would, you know, we'd send an email out um, specifically about that. Um, I am going to let the public health order stuff uh, marinate in everyone's minds for a moment as I am going to switch over to a different topic briefly, which is that Alta has, and some of you may have received it in the mail, Alta has uh, received a, um, excuse me, a, well, we've put out a request for a proposal for a facilitator for our board of directors meetings. And so one of the things I was hoping for, and uh, you certainly don't have to uh, be spontaneous and coming up with your answers right now, is, um, you know, looking at targeted possible outreach to different folks about um, board facilitation. Are there groups beyond just our service provider network? That you may recommend that we reach out to to try to find a facilitator for boards. Board facilitation is something that is required, um, and Alta is going to be looking at doing a uh, three-year um, contract with a provider to um, not only support uh, those clients that are regional center board members, but also to support all the board members to do things like um, develop and implement a, a mentoring program where we can have our existing board members paired up with our um, new, board, new board members when they come on. So if there is anything that um, folks have as far as ideas for kind of targeted um, uh, you know, recruitment, or if there's a specific company or agency that you think the regional center should reach out to, you're welcome to share that idea to me at uh, jdecker at alterregional.org, um, and I'd be happy to kind of uh, look at that. Um, and again, I'll come back to the public health order in just a moment. I will say as well um, that uh, I know we went over our performance contracts um, with the regional center that the regional center has last month. We went over some of the specifics in this group. Um, we also did a presentation, uh, Michelle Johnson and myself. Uh, well, we've done a number of presentations this week about our performance contract, but we did one with our provider advisory committee yesterday. Um, the chairs of the um, subgroups of our provider advisory committee are going to be providing feedback to the regional center. Um, I think we said what by November 5th, um, within uh, some suggested ideas that the regional center could look at implementing in our performance um, uh, contract for next year. I would just broadly say that if folks do have feedback related to our performance contract, 
that are service providers and you're looking at um, submitting that information. Some of you are not participants in our provider advisory committee, but you are certainly welcome to go to um, or just send an email with your ideas to our executive secretary, Lisa West, and that's uh, just lwest at alterregional.org. But really think about like, you know, I would love to see the regional center do this next year. Like these ideas don't come out of nowhere and you guys are the ones that are most closely tied to the clients that we have um, out in the community receiving services. Um, and so it is, I think, really important to get your input on some of the planned activities that the regional center is going to look at doing moving forward. That being said, those of you having the bandwidth to be able to do that right now, oh, bless you, because I know everyone's just trying to figure out how their agencies are going to continue to perform over the next, you know, couple months. And so, um, we, <laughs> I, this is a good time for me to share. Many of you are aware that um, I've been kind of working with the Sacramento News and Review folks and looking at getting a kind of special advertising section, basically to highlight uh, the employment in the field of uh, developmental disability services and looking to encourage folks. And so the uh, Elizabeth, who is the person that's working with Sacramento News and Review to, you know, uh, I put all this stuff together and some of you know her and have worked with her. She said, you know, I sent that out to our providers and I just got, you know, no response from any, any of your people. I'm, I'm amazed. And I said, well, Elizabeth, let me share with you what also came out the same day as your email that you sent to people. And they sent her the public health order. So, and she said, oh my goodness, I, I, no wonder I have not heard back from a bunch of people about this. And so um, I will say that that is something that is certainly still planned. Um, however, we have all decided to kind of take a brief pause um, before we start talking about what people's financial contributions are and things like that. As we all look at what the landscapes of our businesses are going to look like over the next um, month and a half or so. So just wanted to let folks know that is still certainly an opportunity that is available but everyone has big things on their plate right now. And I know it's certainly related to recruitment, retention and everything else, but um, we understand that folks have other things going on. So we will look at promoting this opportunity in the near future, but right now, um, again, we understand that folks have other things that they are focusing on. All right. Um, I'm going to wait to jump back into public health orders again, because I want to just talk about booster shots briefly and kind of what's going on with booster shots. Uh, my understanding of things statewide, um, I'm sure I'm going to say something that I'm going to find out has already changed in the news right now. But to my understanding, as of right now, this moment, the Moderna one has not had the expansion of the um, uh, recommendations. I believe that only the immunocompromised individuals are still able to get the Moderna um, booster shot. We um, know that there is some uh, discussions going on about the possibility of the Moderna opening up more widely in the next week or so. Also some discussion over the next couple of weeks about what it's gonna look like for five to 11 year olds and booster shots. So I hope, I know a lot of, the, a lot of these services here are adult services, but hey, just like us, people have kids and, and are familiar with the school districts and things like that. So one of the things that has been asked of us is, do we think that it would be a good use of everyone's efforts to try to put together booster clinics for five to 11 year olds and my, or excuse me, not booster clinics, uh, vaccine clinics for five to 11 year olds. Right now we do have the, um, mind, uh, Institute over UC Davis, um, that I think is willing to continue to do, um, shots, um, my thoughts is that we will not do this as a community, um, or at least I'm not going to ask a bunch of you guys to do this as a community, because I think that the schools will be saturated with opportunities for the children to receive their vaccinations through the school districts, just like we saw the school districts kind of get up and running in March, April um, of this year when it started with the first shot clinics that they started getting going. Um, we know it took them a little bit longer to get started. so. Um, if folks feel really strongly, like we should be um, encouraging folks to host um, vaccine clinics for five to 11 year olds, I would be really interested in hearing that feedback and kind of what folks thoughts are. We certainly can talk about it, but I'll be also very frank. I'm concerned about the bandwidth of our providers as well to be able to do like one more thing. Um, and right now I think we have 
the school districts that are going to be taking on a big responsibility as it relates to this. Um, I just foresee that that is what is going to occur, but um, a little bit too soon to hear. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there. And if there are folks that feel strongly about it, you know, you can always shoot me an email and, and we can discuss it as well. But I'm, I'm curious about that. I, we are, um, some of you are residential service providers and you may have received an email that went out for me yesterday, I believe. Um, with the announcement that Alert Home Health is going to be coming out to do booster shots out at residential care facilities. Um, we wanted to send that out because we didn't want to think that that was just a weird company that was cold calling people, but uh, Cabelia Houston, our clinical director, has been working and developing this relationship with them so that we um, can, uh, so that we can start getting some of these um, vaccine boosters going. We learned um, in our discussions with Safeway Pharmacy and others that the um, there's not going to be like that concerted federal pharmacy partnership program like there was for the um, initial COVID uh, vaccinations that occurred. That being said, um, I've already received some great feedback from some of our residential providers that Anderson Brothers and some of the other pharmacies that you guys might be familiar with have already started to go out and do some booster shots out at the homes. Um, what we're working on at Alta, and I know GDS is working on it as well, is how we're going to record all of the information for the booster shots. Unfortunately, our computer system at Alta is not set up yet to uh, uh, record the third dose. So we're also pending additional information for our facility liaisons. We emailed all of them yesterday that our facility liaisons for our residential um, facilities that we'll be giving them additional guidance on how to report uh, report in the vaccination uh, boosters. In the meantime, what we directed folks to do was just reach out to your facility liaison provide them an update once your clients, once your staff have had um, those booster opportunities. I am, again, you know, looking at boosters more widely for our entire population and the availability of possibly having you all as service providers hosting booster clinics. Um, again, I just am concerned right now about including that thought of adding that work to everyone while they're just assessing their, you know, Deeper their readiness to continue to serve clients. And so um, you did I think right? there will be folks that are going to be open to it, but, um, but I want to make sure that uh, as always, we're not doing anything that's like too onerous for you guys. It's just like the survey that we're looking at putting out. Like we don't want to make things any harder because of us, if that's the case. And that's why also, like I mentioned, we'll, um, be committed to getting some more feedback from DDS about some of the specifics as it relates to the public health order. So, jumping back to the public health order, is there any questions that folks want to discuss? Anything that has popped up in the chat that we want to go over? Um, if the consumer is not providing services, okay. FDA voted to recommend a booster dose of J and J vaccine at least two months after the first dose. Um, so we know that we did have a lot of clients that did get the J and J um, that wanted to just kind of go through the one shot regimen rather than two. Um, also, you know, right now the booster doses that are coming out are um, being tested. You know, a booster for Moderna if you received the Moderna, a booster for Pfizer if you received Pfizer. Um, our friends at Safeway Pharmacy, who we at Alta are working on um, hosting our own vaccine booster clinic for our own employees in the beginning of well like the second week of November, um, they did indicate that there is some studies that are going on right now and taking a look at, you know, okay, I received the Johnson and Johnson, you know, can, can, or should I get the Pfizer or, uh, or the Moderna for the booster? None of that has been finalized. My understanding is all the boosters are still aligned with what the original doses were, but that's some additional, you know, things that are going on right now when they're looking at the more longer term effectiveness of some of the vaccines. I think the thing that is nice to, um, be abundantly clear about is that our cases of COVID have dropped significantly since the month of August. So in the month of July, we saw a huge rise in cases. In the month of August, we saw a number of cases. We saw deaths. It was bad across our entire, whether it was clients, you know, our own staff, service provider staff, everyone. Um, we are coming out of that, um, at least right now, as far as uh, the data shows. So if you look at the data that's provided on um, California Department of Public Health's website, you'll see how we had a August, you know, rise, but now you'll see that we're coming back out on the bottom end of it. 
I think we're still looking at 16, 17 new cases a day, something like that in Sacramento County, Yolo County, you know, a little bit higher, but, um, and I know that mask mandates, things like that, there was some discussion about those being going away once they get down to, I think, five, six new cases. So we're, we're not quite there yet, but, um, you know, we have the other reality of um, the vaccine mandate that everyone's facing for December 1st. Um, Part of the vaccine mandate, and I want to, I think it was Christina that emailed me about the specifics within the public health order. One thing I really want to point out again is that when you're offering those exemptions, um, being mindful of the requirements then, if you are offering those exemptions, meaning the requirement to have the mask on at all times while you're within the facility, the requirement to have, um, and uh, that there is the, obviously the testing that is going on as well. Um, again, I'm not a, your employment attorney, nor a employee of the California Department of Public Health. However, we've made a determination that, you know, or, well, we've, we've looked at that the requirement appears for testing to be the, the, the responsibility of the employer. Um, and so I think that's what I've heard across the board from employee employers, vendors as well, is that everyone is looking at that as their responsibility. So low cost testing, things like that are going to be key. Also, making sure that there's a sufficient amount of PPE that's going to be available. I will say we have a supply of N95 masks, DD, and we're going to have to look at getting rid of uh, some of those. So I'm going to be, we'll, we'll have a discussion about um, getting out those cases of N95s in advance of Thanksgiving um, because we've got all those cases and we've got a whole lot of service providers that are going to have staff that are going to be required to wear N95s all the time and even if we can just give a case of them you know the big cases for each provider um that would be helpful and so we'll have to take a look at what we've got um and what we can provide but this is going to be one of those first come first serve type things uh not everything's going to be available for everyone we'll probably set a relatively short time frame an hour or two hours or something like that maybe we'll do a live stream of coffee with community services out in front of the harvard office as we give out N95 masks to all of our vendors, that might be an interesting way to do our coffee with community services one day. So just know that that's in the works for us as well. You know, certainly um, we know that this mask mandate is going to have, uh, excuse me, the vaccination mandate is also going to have a requirement for the, all that additional PPE that um, folks are going to have. Has OSHA weighed in on the mandate? My understanding is that we're still awaiting OSHA guidance related to uh, 100 plus employees. Has anyone heard anything different related to that? No? Okay. So, I mean, that's another aspect of all of this as well is that, um, you know, that, that guidance is still, still out there. My understanding is that failure to follow this, you know, there is some fines that, you know, can be levied. I'm not, I'm not exactly, I don't think I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about it. I don't think I've ever read exactly what um, the proposed fines would look at being for not following this public health order. But again, those would be within your review of your own company's liability when it comes to whether or not you're going to be granting um, those exemptions and things like that. So um, other questions about public health orders, things like that? Implementation? Uh, another question is Andrew again. Sorry, <laughs> just yeah, of, of where, um, I, I was just thinking uh, that I was in a meeting yesterday with a bunch of other providers um, from other regional centers, and someone had, and I don't know that this is true either, but maybe when we get clarification from DDS, someone had made a comment about um, the uh, these rules or these things, and also you know not denying services to folks uh, were only for licensed programs, but that seems odd to me because there's um there was a provider somewhere else that decided they weren't going to uh, provide services to anybody who was not vaccinated and like uh, that's but they're not licensed so they felt that they were able to do that um, yeah maybe, maybe they got a little confused with that uh you know the light the adult and senior care licensees and how they were included in that first like the a bullet point yeah but, um yeah, I, I don't know that I've heard that one. Has other folks heard about this or folks thinking that this only pertains to licensed settings? Yeah, that, that would not be guidance we would certainly give out. Um, I so Olivia, oh, sorry, go ahead. Andrew. Oh, I didn't think so. And it was also like they kind of came across the uh, for um, like program participants that they could require program participants to be vaccinated. 
because they were not licensed was the other piece of that that I thought was hmm. different, but did. Yeah, I don't know that it's keyed off of that at all. Um, and so, Olivia, these are good areas of uh, clarification that we need to seek, especially if they're, especially if DDS is saying anything or responding in any way to um, messages from folks. I guess it's my question is more along the lines of the um, denying service piece for participants as far like than the a licensed, non licensed, whatever. Yeah. So one of the questions was uh, one of the questions that got brought up by one of our specialists, Christina, was the looking at ex exception versus exemption. So, for example, the exceptions that are laid out there have that. Uh, so this is our understanding of it, and this is what we've discussed in I think this setting before is that the exceptions apply, and and there's a description of what those exceptions are for, but that you may also give an exemption to individuals, and that. The provisions that apply to the exceptions do not apply to those that you give exemptions to. The exemptions that you give to people, you're going to have to determine then what accommodation you're willing to provide to those individuals as well. And that was a discussion that came up in our ILS meeting, and then it was a, a discussion that came up, I think, in our coffee with community services after that. That um, you know you can make these exemptions related to it, um, but that the uh, Accommodations that you choose to make that go along with those uh, exemptions are where your liability lies with your company. Um, and so, one of the questions that's come up, well, you know, the public health order gives us what the accommodation should be. The accommodation is that they have to wear the masks, and the accommodation is that they have to do the testing. Um, what I would say is that's what the order says. Um, and I would say what I've been saying in meetings is that. You should take that then and make a determination what you as your agency are willing to open up yourself to liability for if you do follow the public health order and um, to a T and, and, and the accommodation that you're providing is that. And so I know that's what a lot of people are going back and forth with about right now. Um, and Nikki gave a very good explanation as to the way her agency is looking at it, which is that, you know, homelessness is not something that is tolerable in, in this uh, discussion. And so, um, again, I think these are important discussions that we're going to keep having and people are, you know, especially as this becomes more and more apparent to folks. I still think that the full depth of the um, challenge that folks are facing won't really reveal itself even for the next couple of weeks or so. But I think that's when we're, you know, at least on the community services level, we're going to start hearing a lot more from our different services um, providers related to that. And Christina, I have a question. Does, does that seem to make sense or did you want to um, kind of discuss it a little bit with folks while we're going over? Yeah, I think just for my own clarity in terms of if I'm interpreting that correctly, because the way it reads to me implies that if somebody does fall under one of the medical or religious exemptions, that that would mean that they can only serve one household. But I don't know if I'm reading that correctly. That well, is I, not how our employment attorney read it. <laughs> that is how I read it, though, when I first read it. I'll be honest with you. Uh, me and some of the folks from, like, our HR department and other people, were re like, our HR manager were reading this when it first came out. And I was like, oh, well, how are we going to apply this? But then after rereading it multiple times, talking to our attorneys and everything else, there is that uh, difference between the exception aspect of it and the exemption aspect of it. Um, so the exception means you don't have to follow it. The exemption means you have to follow it, but you're going to be exempt from it because your employer is giving you the allowable exemption, basically. So again, those individuals that qualify for an exception would not require an exemption. What do you guys think about that? Is that a good answer? I see Nikki shaking her head. I see several, a few of you shaking your head. And so that that I think is something to get clarification on possibly, but that would be my, certainly my reading of it as not an employee of the California Department of Public Health um, was that that the, that would probably be something that's separate. You know, you have the exception here, you have your exemptions here. No liability on my end, but that's how our employment attorney read it as well. So. We're gonna um, mute out the part where she said no liability on my end, and then we'll just, we'll play it from there. I don't have a law degree either, so you can go ahead and take my advice if you want. <laughs> All right, um, there was some discussions that uh, 
the step agency just real quickly had made about possibly offering an opportunity to have a, a group discussion with their employment attorney. And so um, that will be another thing that we follow up with them if that's something that they might still be willing to do. Um, I know for some of our smaller service providers that might not have that ability or if people, if you're like me, you just want to hear a lot of different feedback from different people before you make a decision that's going to especially impact people's employment. Like that's a really very serious task that you guys have. And so um, definitely lots of feedback that would be, I'm sure, appreciated. Um, if there are additional things that you would like to, us to try to do our best to get clarification from DDS on, um, as it relates to this, we certainly are going to be um, doing the uh, uh, the questions that were raised related to the uh, regional center clients that are employees. Um, sorry if this was mentioned earlier, we're gonna the question here. My internet is acting funky. Is there any word about the extension of alternative services? Right now, POS is go to, oh, thank you for um, asking that question because I should have updated you guys on this because I talked about it yesterday at the provider advisory committee. So again, what I will say is at this time, we have knowledge that the alternative services are going to be continued through till um, December 31st of 2021. We know that the department is in the process of codifying things like ongoing you know, regulations and things like that. I do not know the extent to which that is currently going on with alternative services right now, but what I do know is that I have not seen anything in writing yet um, that alternative services will continue beyond December 31st. Um, that being said, if we remain in a state of emergency on December 31st of 2021, there's probably a likelihood that they're going to continue them on. Um, but again, we don't have anything in writing specifically about that right now. So purchases uh, should be continued through till uh, December 31st. I know we initially had a bunch of them that were ending at the end of September and uh, Tracy and her team, the managers went through and did the best to make sure that we got all of those ones updated and in. Other questions that you have related to some of this stuff, what I can, um, share with you is, uh, you know, sending them in to us at the regional center is, is very helpful. Um, and ideas that you have on creative ways that we might be able to address the lack of residential supports that may exist um, are also something that, you know, we are certainly interested in hearing feedback from folks about. So with that being said, um, my next presentation that I'm scheduled. Oh, sorry, Nikki, go ahead. Yes. I did have a question. Yeah. So um, when might we hear back about some of the ideas that we've proposed? Well, and whether you're... or not those would be acceptable. Yeah. So I would say we're probably about a week or so okay. away from like really doing that. Um, Denise and uh, Olivia are going to be getting together and meeting with me where we can kind of go over some of the different um, items that were discussed and then okay. it really is going to turn out it's going to turn into I have to get you know Michelle the ADs and everyone completely informed about how we might look at trying to tackle this and then we have to put out something in writing to our service coordinators um, and let them know about different options that might be available in the residential realm um, so now is the great time to let us know about any ideas that you have because those are all like the steps that we have to go in place just before we send out one email about it um, so thank you, you know, for you guys and, um, and like I said, with that being said, my next presentation I'm supposed to be giving begins right now in a different meeting. So I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you for hanging with us. Uh, as I've said, in a number of these meetings, we are certainly all in this together as we try to navigate this. All right. Thank you so much folks. Have a great weekend. Look forward to talking to folks next week.